we've been I've been doing this performance tuning clinic in a number of different venues for a number of uh, different you know, for, for a while now, and I think it works well for performance because uh, performance is a broad topic. And so if I pick some narrow aspect of it, it's very likely that most people are not going to be interested in anything that we have to say. And uh, the other thing too is that um, I co-founded this. Um, this unconference called uh, JCrete, which we run uh, every year on the island of Crete, on the island of Crete. Uh, so it's a um, really wonderful conference where we actually get um, many of the uh, leading um, developers on the planet together. Uh, so a lot of these people, we get uh, people like Cliff Click shows up. Cliff Click is actually uh, responsible for, for putting the hotspot engine inside the JVM. And we've had Attila Segedi, um, who's actually responsible for putting uh, JavaScript inside the JVM. And there's a whole bunch of other people. Uh, I, I guess if we have Paul and Gail show up, and uh, they've done a lot of work with Gluon, is actually responsible for JavaFX. And, and Sebastian, we have him show up, and he does a lot of things there. And so, so there's a lot of very interesting people that show up, and a lot of them are in the performance space or in, 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 are doing a lot of interesting things. And, and that's why we set this thing up. Is that, you know, we want to set up an, an environment where we can mix regular developers and maybe somewhat newbie developers with some very experienced developers and make this environment where we can just sit and have a conversation about things, right? And so that's basically what we do. Um, and since then, I've sort of been down on presentations and more up on just having conversations. So I hope in that spirit that we could have a two-way conversation uh, about performance. And, and you know, so the conversation will go whatever direction it goes. And the conversation we have will be whatever conversation we decide to have here. And I imagine there's some people in the room here that have some really nice expertise with the performance team, and I hope that they can also um, share their expertise when there's questions that uh, arise. Um, uh, that, you know, so it's not just our voice, it's um, everybody's voice that is important here. Okay, So that's how we will uh, start the whole thing. And um, to get this going, I'll, I'll introduce uh, Sebastian, who is uh, a developer advocate and uh, Kubernetes container, whatever you call it. yeah, whatever you call it, um, specialty. And I'm, you know, been trying to drag him into performance. So um, I think we will, because <laughs> right now it doesn't perform very well. But, <laughs> <laughs> but he'll perform better. Yeah, right. Yeah. And um, yeah, so he can say whatever. Say a like. few things as well. Yeah. Um, so hi from my side as well. My name is Sebastian. I. I'm a what's called developer advocate for IBM, so I try to share knowledge on stuff in general, enterprise stuff and Java stuff, and try to combine these. So then you end up with uh, buzzwords like cloud native, um, containers, Kubernetes, Istio, and all these things that you might or might not uh, need. And I'm also a big fan of unconferences, as it happens, I uh, co-organized two Java conferences uh, as well. One is in Japan and the other one is in Germany. Um, don't ask me how these two get together, but um, one is called J Onsen. Um, and Onsen, if you don't know that, is a Japanese hot spring, which is a super relaxing experience if you haven't been to one, so that's a great opportunity to do so. Uh, I hope Kirk can um, comment on that as well, because he has been to J Onsen. Yeah, I've been to all of them. And exactly. I don't, I don't intend on stopping to come. <laughs> so uh, one of the things that we wanted to do was inspire other people to have uh, conferences. So we had uh, Stephen Chin and uh, Sebastian come in our conference, and that's when we start uh, J Spirit. J Spirit as well. That's at a distillery in Germany. And J Onsen and J Alba and Lava One, which is in Hawaii. If you want to go to the next one conference in Hawaii in January. So you get the idea, pick any cool, nice location and do some Java content there. That's basic. And yes, and J Spirit is really nice because you actually have that in a distillery in the Bavarian. Bavarian house, house, yeah, in the winter. In the so winter that's, that's a nice setting as well. Yeah, it's really nice. Okay, so, so we try, like to do fun things and interesting things, but um, the topic tonight was supposed to be performance, but uh, uh, sorry, 
Sebastian was going to be in the area, so I said, you know, we can't miss the opportunity of having him join in, and so we'll, you know, talk on containers performance or anything like that. And again, if you have experiences to add, your, your voice is important. We'll certainly pass the mic around. So, with that, um, I'll. Uh, is someone going to break the ice, or somebody has to? Guess. Somebody has to break the ice. You thought if you thought you were going to sit here and rest and just relax and sleep, I mean, that's not what an unconference, unpresentation is about. So uh, I'll, I'll shuttle the mic around and you check. Okay. So we had a presentation a few months ago on um, JVM performance in containers. Uh -huh. So what's happened in the last few months with <laughs> JVM performance in containers? What did what did, what actually did were you? So what were you told about uh, JVM performance in containers? Um, what was, Paul, do you remember can you who give us the elevator? I'm trying to remember the name, but uh, it was one of the JVM engineers working on uh, basically trying to shrink the JVM uh, using the new Jigsaw stuff, but beyond. Uh, I think he had, had an example of a five megabyte JVM that could run, okay. uh, obviously without garbage collection, but um, and some other features that were really stripping it down. So, but obviously, we mean, we try obviously without garbage collection. Um, so they were taking like they were taking away services in order to get you know right, JVM okay. put them down and that small sure. the idea that if you have quick startup disposable containers and you don't need garbage collection if you're just going to throw it away the process is done. Okay, very quick. It's an interesting idea. Um, want to start or do you want to start? I can start on that. So in general, um, what's going on is that it basically doesn't make a big difference whether where you run your JVM or especially in uh, performance. Uh, whether you run, uh, whether or not you run a container. I mean, the whole thing about container is just like it's more manageable to run your stuff, but ultimately it runs on the same hardware in the same right. way as it would run otherwise. So there's, uh, first of all, not not much to pay attention to. Yeah. Okay. So I'll talk about the garbage collection thing because <clears throat> I do uh, more garbage collection tuning than I would care to admit to. Actually, probably you know, almost on a daily basis of taking some of these garbage collectors. Um, so, um, I'll come over here. Oh, right. Okay. Yes, we know him. Yes, he gave it. Um, yes, and so if he says something on containers, then that's 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 gold. Yes, that's good. Mikhail Vidstedt. Yeah, yes. from Oracle. Mikhail is uh, yeah, he's yeah, he's he's very good. Okay, so <laughs> you had the right guy. Um, so so. What happened was that um, a couple of years ago, Alexei Shipilev, who actually works for Red Hat, used to be an Oracle uh, performance engineer, um, decided to write uh, Epsilon GC, which is actually a, no, uh, as a null garbage collection implementation of the GC interface inside the JVM. And um, at first he put it in and because he just said, you know, I just want to test throughput and I want to get rid of all the barriers that are there because, um, uh, you know, uh, when you're garbage collecting, you know, the, it's multi-threaded and there's things that have to cooperate with other threads and, and, and because of all this, you have to put all these barriers in and they, and they have to be jitted into your code in the right place and it's a real pain in the neck. I say neck, right? Okay. Um, and, um, and, 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 it, and you get this, Throughput interference, right? So, so when you look at garbage collection, you have it's basically a balance of work between allocators and the garbage collector itself. And so, um, what he wanted to do is he just wanted to say, like, I just want to see straight through, straight up throughput. And I just want to run benchmarks where I just don't care about garbage collection, so I'm just going to rip it out. I don't need barriers. I'm going to worry about the, what the jet's doing and all this stuff. And and as soon as he announced that, I, look, I, I emailed him and I said, okay, this is fantastic, because now I can think of a, a number of use cases where you can actually use this in production environments, where uh, right now you have applications that are written so that they don't actually trigger garbage collection during their lifetime, but you still take on the penalty of all of the barriers and all the work you have to do in order to cooperate with the garbage collector that's there. And so actually stripping the garbage collector out in this Epsilon GC is going to be uh, a really uh, brilliant addition to uh, OpenJDK. Now, um, the only thing I can say is that writing a garbage collector is a non-trivial activity. It generally takes somewhere around, you know, five or more years to actually stabilize the thing, like once you get it written. 
and you need to make sure that you got all the barriers in the right place because if you don't, you're going to like six eight V or JVM and then everything crashes and burns and you know bad things happen. And so, um, so that's pretty much what they're in the process of doing now is just making sure that you can actually run production level code in with Epsilon uh, GC or with no garbage collector, right? So you, you spin it up, you use it, and when you're done, you tear it down and that's the ultimate garbage collection, is just tear down the JVM. And that's pretty much where we are. I don't know if anyone's used it or played with it. No? Is, it, is that what they would use for like the functions or serverless? With, is that what they would use for serverless? Um, <clears throat> for serverless is really like an Amazon thing, right? Yes, and that's uh, awesome. And that's Amazon great. is a completely different story. Um, I mean, you would use it for functions that are literally just one-shot objects that you spin up and you definitely want to tear them down afterwards. Um, so yes, that's, that's a thing and it's connected, somewhat connected to containers in a way that containers typically, you know, start up and once you tear them down and everything is gone, so that also works quite well. Um, yeah, that's basically all, all I can think of. Okay. So, yeah, so, so uh, right now uh, what Amazon has done is they've actually, um, uh, uh, okay, so you know, the, uh, so you, you guys are all aware of the new licensing issues with, uh, and release issues with uh, LTS and support and stuff like that. I think Mikhail might have uh, brought some of that up on his talk. Maybe not, I don't know. We, we um, had a big session in December on it. Yeah, okay, so, uh, so there's a number of different groups that, so right now I think we're in a position where Java is um, at the verge of um, fragmenting. Right, and where we're actually going to see the fragmentation come from is well, it's already actually fragmented, but the fragmentation is not public. And so, how does this happen? It happens because um, uh, Alibaba has their own internal JVM team, uh, Twitter has their own internal JVM team, um, Goldman Sachs. Uh, I think there's even we've had hints the Dutch government wants to set up their own internal JVM team. To support them, uh, so so there's all these companies like Amazon again. You know, it's like you want a job. Amazon's hiring JVM engineers right now. They're I think they're half staffed, so they probably need about uh, uh, about a dozen more people, right? Okay. So um, a lot of these companies, Azul has their own build um, as, as another example. So a lot of these companies, um, what they've done is they just they grab OpenJDK and they take that and they build it and then they just start adding stuff to it. So, you know, uh, I saw a presentation at uh, Oracle Code 1 where the Alibaba guys had added some really scary features to the JVM that I would hope the gatekeepers would never allow in the open source project. Um, you know, so, you know, but, you know, that's what they've done. Twitter, I know, has done the same. Um, Amazon is actually going to end up doing the same. Uh, the Zulu guys, Zing guys have done the same. And we have a new project, uh, well not a new project, but also a follow-on project which is called Adopt OpenJDK. I don't know if you've heard of Adopt OpenJDK, but this is basically the, uh, the version of the JVM, or sorry, the JDK that Amazon is using. They just came to London and basically sniffed around for a bit and basically pirated it off with everything and you know, hit it behind a firewall. So a lot of these different implementations are hidden behind firewalls, so you're not going to see what they've done. But a lot of this work is actually creeping back out into OpenJDK, and then we're using these, these builds in, in different places, but they're all sort of like behind companies, and you know, that's what's going on. So really the only what we call true, true community build of the JDK right now is a doc OpenJDK that's run by the uh, London uh, Java community. Uh, the LJC, and um, so that's all on hosted servers, and they get have support from uh, IBM, and, and they used to have support by, from Red Hat, and they have, sorry, they used to have support from Oracle, but they do have, I believe, support from Red Hat, and a couple of other companies. So our company has actually thrown a lot of resources into helping them build, helping build up the Adopt Open JDK uh, infrastructure, but um, not really a performance talk topic, but. You know, um, what we're seeing um, now is that 
a lot of these companies are just making these changes uh, internally. Amazon is offering them out, but I think that um, in terms of um, what we see from Epsilon GC, um, unless Oracle actually is able to push Epsilon back into OpenJDK, then it's not going to get into the Adopt OpenJDK, which means it's not going to get into the Amazon-specific build, which means that, you know, basically we're seeing some fragmentation or some fork in terms of functionality uh, within uh, the JDK itself, depending upon where you get your builds from. Um, so, will it show up? I don't know. It depends on what happens over the next uh, year or two in terms of consolidation or fragmentation. It's definitely a good, a good point, yeah. I mean, what I personally care uh, a lot about is that the whole thing should stay in and come and stay open as an open source. Which is why we've thrown our weight behind Adopt yes. and why we think that uh, other companies should throw their weight behind Adopt and we know a number of companies that will. I'm not sure if I can announce them or not, so maybe I will anyways. But you know, but there are there are several. There's there's a whole host of com uh, companies and countries now that are actually uh, jumping on the adopt bandwagon because they see that as a as a really it's a, it's a implementation and build that's not behind a company's firewall, right? So they can actually see what's going on. Well, I can speak for IBM that they support uh, yeah uh, adopt OpenJDK and also OpenJ9, which is uh, another right. And OpenJ and OpenJ is fully open source. So yeah, so on, and uh, Open J, Open J9 is actually being built at Adopt also. Exactly. Yeah, so, so that's that's maybe a follow-up uh, topic that's a little bit connected to uh, performance. What I see quite some efforts uh, being put in is to <coughs> sorry, is to specifically improve startup performance, yeah. which traditionally was not the main effort within a JVM, right? It was mostly about throughput and performance once it's up and running and work being warmed up with Hotspot and everything we have filled in. Uh, but especially with more and more, let's say, I don't want to say serverless because that's such a buzzwordy thing, but with more and more requirements coming in from, I also don't want to say from the cloud, that's another buzzword, but from environments where you spin up things fast, where you just want to have proper, decent, and reasonable startup performance, right? Where you don't want to be in a situation where everybody say, oh, we have to use Go and other native things right. be just because of this sort of performance, but actually where you want to come up with something that is based upon Java or JDK technology and still, well, starts up fast. Right. And there are a few efforts uh, being uh, provided. For example, GraalVM is, uh, is one. That's uh, CDS. Sorry? CDS. Uh, for example, yeah. yes, or OpenJDK, uh, OpenJ9 and uh, the whole team mostly, I mean it's open source, but mostly being backed by IBM, is putting um, a lot of effort in in, in um, reducing and improving that with uh, techniques like uh, AOT, ahead of time compilation, class sharing, and, and all these things, which I believe is just an awesome effort to do. So whether or not you believe in the whole serverless and functions uh, story, but in general it's just, it offers a a big variety of use cases, of new use cases to have something being written in Java that just starts up very quickly. If you think command line tools, if you think a few other things, right? right. So, I, 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 you that's, know, one of the other efforts saying. to really, uh, one of the other efforts is, is that you see that JVM starts slow, right? Yes. They, just, they just start slow because you're running bytecode. And traditionally, it's taken quite some time um, to convert the bytecode to machine code. Actually, that simple benchmark we ran for exercise three, the JIT will keep compiling code on that benchmark if you run it long enough for a, about a half an hour, right? This is like, the amount of code here is like fits on half a piece of paper. And the JIT, after half an hour, is still isn't fully warmed up, uh, which is you know, kind of scary. So if you get into like something really big and complex, you can, you know, just it's scary to think how long it takes for the JIT to actually settle down and say, like, I'm done. Um, actually, I don't think it actually ever really does. Um, so, um, what we have seen now is efforts to stash the JIT, comp JIT compiled code in different places and actually have that available when you start up. So, yeah, you need to be really, really careful when you do this because. Um, there's actual absolute addresses compiled into the machine code 
And if you don't actually figure out where all of these things are and properly swizzle them, you can have some really nasty things happen. At best, you're going to have the you know, segmentation violation. That would be the best thing to happen. At worst, you would get data corruption inside the JVM. And um, you know, that's you know, one of the reasons why they just haven't tackled that problem, because it's just incredibly hard to ensure that when you actually reload the code cache with this compiled code, that it's actually not going to take you down, right? So if everyone thinks it's like a simple thing to do, but um, it's actually a really, really hard engineering problem to solve, but they've really avoided it uh, for some time. But I think Azul has actually made some progress on this uh, in the sense that uh, they, were, they were motivated by uh, market events like market start. So if you look at trading applications, most of the money is made um, at market start. And, um, and then the thing you have to do before market end is to uh, basically set your position for overnight. So those are the two most important parts of the day. The first part of the day is like if you start the JVM up, you're going to start cold. And you've got to like heat the cache and stuff like that. So what they're interested in doing is um, just being able to preheat the cache. Um, you know, people tried all kinds of different tricks for trying to preheat the cache, but uh, I think, you know, the only way you can do it is like ex properly is like external to the JVM. Just exercise it until you think everything's pre is, is heat, hot, and then, and then when you hit the uh, market start, you, then you can go. Um, but, you know, that's, that's tricky to do. Uh, being able to reload the cache with the already compiled code is um, a more interesting um, proposition. And there's no even talk of taking a JIT and actually offering the JIT as a service. So you can pass code or ask for JIT code and it will go to some common repository and pull it out for you. And then pass it back in to the JVM. And that's the code you start executing. So just, you know, if we have enough of a large enough community of, of JIT code, then it's pretty. Um, likely that the code you need is already in JIT, so you can just grab it and use it right away. <laughs> so it's an interesting. Yeah. JIT as a service. <laughs> JIT as a service, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's how we count it. <laughs> so it doesn't even need to be in the runtime. Yes. Yeah. And it's, it's also, I mean, it's, it's, le uh, it's legible, right? So to think about it, if you, especially if you have a lot of microservices that, that basically run the same thing, right? Why do you have to do everything everywhere? Yeah, right? absolutely. And that's part of the thinking. The other thinking is like fast start. The other thing, yep. just yeah. to be faster as a exactly. yeah. Okay. So these are quite interesting methods, especially when you talk about continuous. <coughs> Any other questions? I've got a seed. <laughs> so, all right. Uh, you mentioned earlier today that uh, there are some, well. You had some programs. Can you recommend to some of our community about simple programs they can do to learn about how to profile or performance test, uh, investigate? Uh, yeah, that's... You know, I, you know, I, I generally start all of these workshops, talks and talks and things like that when they actually do a real talk. Um, about saying, you know, there's really three things. It's the triangle thing, right? What talk doesn't have a triangle in it? Is there any talk, right? All talks have to have a triangle, right? So, of course, we have a triangle. And the, and the triangle in this case is um, tools, technology. So it's kind of important that you understand the technology you're working with, so which requires reading specifications. Isn't that nice? No, we don't want to do that. No, it's really bad. Um, for one thing, it's just to help you understand how it works, you know, downloading source code and reading it is another way to help understand how things work. So that's one aspect of it. The other, the other aspect is just, uh, you know, getting out and trying and playing with tools and just understanding how they expose different problems in the technology stack. But when you actually get down to performance tuning uh, a system, like for real, uh, the big thing that everybody is missing is process or methodology. And unfortunately, um, it's one aspect of the industry where we simply don't have anyone prescribing 
uh, are very few people prescribing any uh, type of methodology. Um, so there's some web page I was reading where somebody went over like about 10 different methodologies. So I thought it was, um, some of them were quite amusing. Um, but most of, mostly what we see is that people peck and poke at things as opposed to um, really having a structured, organized, organized approach to uh, performance tuning. And really, when you're tuning a system, you want to try to find first an unbiased measure of what's really going on in your system, and then use that to try to direct a structured investigation of the problem. Right? And, and I stress unbiased because I would say that most of the measures um, that I see are highly biased. And, and I, can, I can ask a question, right? Um, just, we can just do a general survey here, right? So if you, if you have any performance issues in your applications, what do you, what, can maybe just shout out what's your biggest problem and let's try to keep track of what they are. So what's the, what's the biggest performance issue that, that you're facing? Performance issues. Um. Probably just a lot of short-term object creation, churn. Churn, yeah. memory churn? Okay. Um, anybody else want to comment on this? Yeah, say it in the back, let's check it out. Sorry? Your biggest, your biggest problem is machine learning? Yeah. <laughs> that sounds like a performance issue. Um, the data scientists all are using GPUs Operationalizing sort of machine learning component it is uh, so strong because those libraries don't uh, even TensorFlow now it's JNI and it's so uh, fragile. Right. To operationalize right now. Every time there's an update, it's difficult to, to motivate, uh, I guess, uh, the data scientists to move into the uh, programming uh, paradigm that's slow and using GPU. So, um, so, so, so basically, you're saying like, okay, so you're using, you're using a lot of platform stuff then for machine learning? Yeah, maybe it was their work with the Python. With, with Python, so yeah. they, they wouldn't actually want to move to um, something like H3O or something, which is uh, actually more performant. It's difficult to know because they come out of that data, and that data is a little bit Python. Our application is a Java, so if you try to operationalize it with every update breaks, comes out with the application. Right, okay, so it's like a mismatch between, mismatch between Python and your operational okay. uh, data. And yeah. it's the performance, basically. So they do their performance metrics based on Python using GPU. We can get GPUs into our production environment, but
So in the what we have to do is in our side we have something called the Dynatrace, which is the application performance monitor. So we have to go back in time and see what caused this uh, full GC to continuously spawn. Yeah, and it never tells you the truth. I'm not just speaking about the interest, I'm mostly picking this up. Anybody come over here want to comment? Everybody's hiding in the Okay. Um, nope. Excellent. Okay, so um, in my experience, and you know, we looked at a lot of data from a lot of different applications across a lot of domains. Um, the number one problem that most applications face is uh, an insurance, as you suggested. Right? We see this in about 60% um, of the applications uh, that we encounter. Um, it's pretty rare that people recognize that they have a memory churn issue, so that, that you have this memory churn issue and you're recognizing it is you know, good, good on you because, um, a, you know, how do you recognize this? Well, you need good observability in your application, and you would hope that it can give you good observability in your application, but I can say that um, whenever I run in to solve a performance issue in some organization, which I do on a fairly regular basis, the last thing we look at is the data coming from the APM because most of it is useless. Um, and it's not just APM, it's logging and all these other techniques that we use to try to track things. Um, generally, um, they're in there because they're designed to solve yesterday's problems, fight yesterday's battle, right? And um, we are, we're always looking forward and trying to figure out, okay, what's the, what's the new thing? What's the new thing that's happening? And all of the tools suffer from, can I use the term, failure of imagination. They can't imagine what's going to go wrong. So they collect tons of data, hoping they collect the right stuff, but, um, and, and then you end up with a huge bias in measurements, and you end up with uh, people believing that um, other things are happening, and other things are responsible for performance regressions, um, other than, you know, what the, 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 the true uh, bottom is in your application. And uh, that's, that's a very common uh, occurrence. Okay. It's not to say that these tools are completely useless, but they do uh, help solve a lot of problems, but um, we generally find that they don't expose to the problems. Like, I, like I'll say that if you're getting like 5 or 10% um, improvements in performance, what did I say that was? Like you're whittling around the edges. What's happening? Um, when you finally figure out what's happening, um, you get the 4x boost, you get the 5x boost, or the 10x boost, or something like that. That's until you're approaching the speed of the machine. Um, these are the types of boosts you get when you find the true bottlenecks. Another one. Go ahead. So, what, what tools would you recommend? Uh, tools. For finding those well. I'm completely tool agnostic. I'm really about methodology. I'm really about understanding uh, patterns of hardware consumption. Hardware is really the currency of our systems. We have to understand how it is actually being consumed. And we look at uh, patterns of hardware consumption to actually understand what the underlying pressures are on the system so that we can look back and look at the algorithms that might cause these types of pressures and then look back and see what, how, what adjustments we can actually make in these algorithms in order to uh, relieve, the, relieve that pressure. So in other words, get the unit work done with less pressure on that particular portion of the hardware. Um, so uh, for this, uh, we actually have, um, and our company has developed uh, a number of um, machine learning algorithms that we can apply to different problems that will actually look at uh, different aspects of the hardware and, 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 and the values coming out of it actually describing how it's being consumed and feed that, these patterns back in um, to actually direct um, what I would call a, a diagnostic process to understand what's happening in the application in order to you know, create these pressures. So tools, I, I'm really agnostic about them. I, I just want general tools that are 
going to expose the problem that I'm looking for. I'm going to use the methodologies of machine learning um, techniques in order to figure out what it is that I'm actually um, looking for. Um, we do this, um, well, the expression I use is that, um, you know, there's an infinite number of ways your application can break or have regressions, but they, this really only happens in a finite number of ways, right? Infinite number of things that can happen, but they can only happen in a finite number of ways, right? And as soon as we get to finite, then we can iterate over these things. And generally, we find that there's expressions in the hardware that will infer what the actual problems are. And these inferences will come with a bias. That makes any sense. Oh, in the back. Yes, sir. Let me bring the microphone to you. Thank you very much. I have a couple of questions. So one is, uh, sorry. You mentioned that uh, for you the, the third side of the triangle uh, process and technology is the most important one. Yeah, but yeah, so yeah. yeah, but you hardly touched uh, it. So I think it would be helpful for the audience to hear a bit more about what are like, uh, the okay. key, let's say, the, the, the key features of a structured approach. And uh, the other thing, because I don't think that there is one size fits all, uh, how you can those differ in Number one. Number second, since the process can quite well to have and go to the conference, which is very extended time and what you're doing. Um, I'm interested to understand what one of the things that you see in conferences you are trying to avoid in the events that you're organizing, and what new things or new kind of experiences uh, mm. you are willing to achieve. So, uh, thanks in advance. Uh, yeah, very, very good question. Um, I'll start with number two because the answer to number one is, well, yeah, is fine. <laughs> okay, uh, depending on which path we go down. Uh, so, with traditional conferences, uh, you know, we go to traditional conferences, we get them all the time. And, uh, what's the last one we're at? Just like, I think the last one we came up was like the box of Morocco, actually. So we went to Morocco for a nice conference. And uh, and it was really just like, you know, um, I don't know who tracks, who tracks. Not that many slots. Eight tracks, one hour slots, and just like bang, bang, bang on the talks, right? You just come kind of sit, listen, sit, listen, sit, listen. By the end of the day, you're like, okay, well, what the hell happened? Um, and maybe you have to go back and do things and take the, you know, taking notes and trying to find interesting things. But we just find that like people just get information pounded at them for like four, three or four days in these conferences. And so, um, so uh, what we wanted to do with uh, with JPRI, um and the Veron conference style was uh, to actually slow the pace down and have more in-depth conversations and have more inclusiveness. So, so I mean, um, I did a talk at Java One on uh, fork join and parallel streams and stuff like that, with some benchmarking and things like that. Um, when I translate this to jQuery, I took about 10 minutes and said, this is the problem set. And then I had, I don't know, in the room, Peter Lowry, Martin Thompson, uh, if you don't know Martin Thompson, he basically wrote Disruptor Framework. I don't know if you know that framework. You know, so the, I mean, these are really heavy hitters in the low latency space in terms of uh, things they've done. What's the uh, area? You know area? Yeah, area. Project. The messaging project. Oh, have you guys seen this one? Yeah, so it's like another Martin Thompson. You know, uh, right? Um, Richard Porter. So these are really, um, um, really interesting. You're not going to, you're not going to teach them anything about fork joint that they don't already know, right? And Heinz Kubitzen has actually contributed code to the uh, fork joint pool. So, but we can still have very interesting, engaging discussions with them. We, we're just going to throw a problem out there and just like let's do a teardown and rip it apart. And they're 
there are actually people in the room working on fork join, um, um, and uh, they took a lot of these ideas away and pulled over them and distilled them down, and they actually end up uh, being uh, implemented in one form or another in the next version of the JDK, right? So, so by having these deep, meaningful discussions, we find that we're able to uh, affect change, and so um, and meaningful change in, in the ecosystem. Uh, the other thing that we can do at this conference, which is really nice, is we can talk about things that uh, we couldn't talk about in other conferences. For instance, um, uh, one of our people who regularly attends uh, was in Istanbul, and the, uh, yeah, he was working for Hazel Cast. So Hazel Cast, as you know, is, is, is their headquarters is located in the uh, Europe, uh, Asian part of Istanbul. And he was supposed to fly out in the coup packet. And um, so we got uh, basically barricaded with a couple of German Marines in a hotel room uh, with tanks flying around, kind of stuff like that happening, right? And, it, and so that's like one of the more stressful things that happen. But, you know, we're road warriors, we're on the road a lot, and you know, life happens. And we can just sit with our peers and just talk about what the issues are and how we can manage them. Um, you know, so we can get into these really deep personal discussions too, which we really can't do in a, in, a very, in a regular conference. So we set up a safe environment for that. Um, we also uh, encourage people to bring their entire families to the conference, and we encourage their um, significant others, or even kids in one case, uh, in some cases, like, to participate in the conference itself, right? So it's family friendly. And uh, so the, the, a couple of the stories we have out of this is, is that since we created the safe environment for people to come out, we've actually, um, shall we say, seeded a number of conferences with uh, highly competent speakers. But I mean, it's one example. Right? The industry is another example. So there's a number of uh, really competent speakers that are speaking about very deep, interesting topics now in the regular conference stores that really didn't have the confidence to speak in public, but we created an environment where they could participate, and because of that, they, yeah. Um, and uh, really, uh, I mean, one of the ones, Kate, uh, right, yeah, so at 15, she shows up, and she's, you know, okay, I don't really care about this. 16, she's back, and she's sitting in sessions. 17, she's participating, she goes back, she goes back to her high school and starts organizing events in her high school, right? And we're thinking, like, what a wonderful experience that she has that she can now take forward with her as she goes into, uh, into university. And so, um, and there's many more stories like this, but you know, these are the types of things that um, some of them, you know, some of them were stated goals right up front. These are the type of environment that we wanted to set in this conference that we didn't feel we could actually um, set in a, in a regular conference environment. That's a very good point, and that's also one of the things I admire the most of you, especially have some of these, you know, um, uh, happenings that you would not get at a normal conference. Like, for example, if you have um, some partner or spouse joining who is maybe not technical, but then also join for a topic that affects, you know, all of us or could affect all of us, such as work-life balance, such as you know, working with, with traveling them with family and all these things, where you don't have to be a technical person to show up or organize such a session. We just can uh, philosophize about these things. Yeah, I think uh, Maurice Nafton's uh, uh, partner is a clinical psychologist. And she said, oh, I'm going to put up the session here. And we had a clinical psych trained clinical psychologist actually sitting in your session with us. Um, last year, we had a physiotherapist talk about ergonomics or ergonomics and health issues and things like that. And so, well, I mean, obviously, everybody can learn from it. Yeah, so it's, it's, but this is people coming in the market. Talk about different things that uh, normally you don't hear at a tech conference. Like, um, you know, we, I mean, we've had this conversation before uh, you know, uh, you know, about protecting IP. It's something that a lot of technical people don't really understand the importance of. We don't really understand trade laws, trade secrets, patents, and all of these other things. But they are here. They're real, and we have to deal with them. Right? And sometimes we have to protect ourselves um, by using these tools. And so, we, so we have, and that can actually help us 
understand how these things work. And how they work in the other conferences. You don't see these, these things happening at regular conferences. As well as the right? Exactly. Yeah. So it's nice to have the growl team and then just be able to pick their brains apart. Okay, why don't we take a 10 minute break here? Yeah, I'm going to do the part one of the question. Just part, yeah, you'll get part two after the break.